John King earned his MFA from New York University in 2010. His work has appeared in Palooka, Gargoyle, The New Yorker, and The 15 Views of Orlando Project, and others. He is currently a composition Sherpa at the University of Central Florida, and he is the host of the amazing, and I can confirm that it is indeed amazing, writing podcast, The Drunken Odyssey. Please welcome John King. It's coming right at me. Um, uh, one slight correction, it's the New York, oh. New York, not the New Yorker. Slight difference. <laughs> <laughs> details, <Yeah>. details. <clears throat> so as Nathan pointed out, in the public imagination, Orlando equals Walt Disney World, and I just wanna preface my story by saying, this is not about Walt Disney World. This is called Fantasia Land. <laughs> Lucy's working the tiny people attraction. When the queue gets unwieldy and the obese visitors congeal out of the candy cane entrance into the sweltering oppression of the noonday sun, Lucy stands in the shade of the giant honeysuckle tree and manipulates them into lines of perspiring fat. She wears that Swiss floral dress all the girls in Fantasia Land wear, but somehow, the swell of her hips, the slight pout of her mouth, those Dutch flats, she looks so beautiful. The scene is even more dazzling than it looks in the brochures and TV commercials. I'm loading people into the sky gondolas for my post here at the base of Big Rock Candy Mountain. I escort them into these buckets suspended on a giant cable, lock the door, and swing the little gondola around the trip mechanism so that it goes out and up. I hope the visitors can't see how much Lucy is just making me cream. Her blonde hair hangs limp from her big shoulders. Normally I don't find girls sexy once I've done them, and that was true of Lucy at first, but something's changed. She makes me quiver like a tuning fork now. When she directs visitors with a two-fingered point, I want to fill the canals of tiny people with my splooge. I love Lucy. I close the door in another sky gondola on a man, woman, and child, and they are uplifted into the golden blue firmament where God smiles over them like a slobbering Saint Bernard. I am so high on psilocybin. <laughs> I took the mushrooms just before my shift started. They're at it again, says Camden. They've flung down the gauntlet. We'll fix their wagon, Cam, I say. Somewhere in Futureland, the crew on the other end of the sky gondola is cramming as many tourists as it could into each bucket, thus daring us to outcram them. This way, sir, I say to a man with his teenage daughter, just have a seat. There's already three people in that car. She can sit on your lap. I lock the gondola door and then yank the bucket around and they creep up jerkily into the sky. The girl smiles blindingly over bony bent knees. Her dad's face is red and pulsing. I wave and then turn to the waiting flesh pods. I coax a family of eight into the next gondola and cautiously sweep a girl's tentacle out of the way before latching the door. I keep the line bustling with a smile. After five minutes, the cable seems to be sagging between the gondolas black curves in the air. Camden is smiling wide, as if he doesn't even have a jaw inside that big red mouth. The air is humid, musty with sucrose particles. The Big Rock Candy Mountaineers have begun their yodeling far above me. Lucy is across the promenade, directing the queue like Julie Andrews with the Von Tropp ogres. Couldn't we wait for the next car, asks visitor. This is the way you're supposed to write it, I say, and watch them contort inside the shadows of the gondola. I latch the door, zing the vehicle forward. I turn. Three 914s are in front of me, chunky angels in bikini tops, and the blonde one has plaid skin that looks liquid to the touch, her hair a mane of chocolate syrup, frozen in a static moment, 
while everything else vibrates staccato and spastic and lovely. I extend my hand to help these 914 girls into the gondola after an armadillo had scampered in. I forget to overload this gondola. The plaid one is smiling at me as I latch the door, and I grab the vehicle to yank it forward, but a pink lariat whips out of her mouth and seizes my hand. I'm uplifted out of the station, my legs spread wide. The gondola feels hot against my face, but I look up at the 914 girl, whose plaid cheekbones puckered in concern. Droplets of water are landing on my wrist, which is stretching the girl's tongue. I hear screams below as all three girls try to grab my hand, but the sounds are getting dimmer as we ascend towards a canyon in Big Rock Candy Mountain. It is raining. If the car doesn't pass the portal in the sugary steps, then I'm going to fall a long, long way. Amidst all this yodeling, the girls are yelling at me. Give me your hand, she says. The armadillo has crawled atop the gondola and is looking down disdainfully with his sunglasses. Give me your hand, she says, and I swing my other hand up to her. I get my feet planted against the gondola, and the bucket makes it up over the gap and levels off. Bef below us, far right, the robot animals of Jungle Quest hobble through their beautiful routines. I lift myself up over the railing of the gondola, and I'm given a plaid kiss that milks my mind of every last thought. And she blinks demurely and smiles, and her friends smile, and we are just like that, creeping along, my feet slipping towards the future when... Lucy is scanning the crowd. Smiling is second nature to her, as is coaxing the visitors into a large, solitary queue into the tiny people attraction. When someone asks where the bathroom is, where the queue to Big Rock Candy Mountain is, or occasionally, where tiny people is, she points away with two fingers where they need to go. The world peace jingle is enmeshed in her marrow at this point. There's no fighting that catchy thing, but it is also as insubstantial as the air. She is, much of the time, operating on an automatic level, not much different than the robotic presidents in Patriot Town, the fuzzy saber-toothed yetis haunting Big Rock Candy Mountain, or even the spangled dolls of tiny people except that she is scanning the crowd. It makes Lucy's blood shriek, the knowledge that this custodial nothing had give, given Lucy's boyfriend a blowjob. Jacob is destined to marry Lucy. She's heard from Brittany that Penelope has blown Jacob after hours in the temple scene of Jungle Quest, which Jacob denied, but Lucy kept questioning him and questioning him and questioning him and questioning why Brittany would lie like that, and questioning how he knew Penelope at all, and asking what kind of a name is Penelope anyway, and did Penelope's sweeping route take her through Exotic Island near Jungle Quest? How would I know, said Jacob. Because she sucked you off, thought Lucy. Where is the potty, asked a little girl in a velvet gown and tiara. On the other side of Big Rock Candy Mountain, said Lucy, smiling down, pointing down towards a rockwork with two fingers. She looks at the alpine loading bay for the sky gondolas and notices that Alex, her first Fantasia Land crush, was staring at her, his sunglasses fixed inscrutably in her direction, while his body hurled another gondola out of the station. A breeze flickers through the honeysuckle leaves, a hint of drizzle. Lucy flips her wrist, checks the time on her watch, time in her rotation for her to load the boats. She pivots, the Dutch flats pinching her feet. As she begins to descend the exit ramp, Lucy can hear behind her the plastic, the plastic clang of a silent butler as its trash bucket is lifted from the red concrete of Fantasia Land. Beneath the hundred-foot silk daffodil, Lucy asks, how many in your party? The visitor chews her lip, turns to make an inventory of her family, gazes in astonishment at the necessary arithmetic. Perhaps it is the 80 phases of the Tiny People Anthem, playing now with a xylophone, sitar, and timpani drum. Five, the visitor ventures. Row six, says Lucy with a smile, pointing with two fingers towards the numbered chutes leading to the boats. The Tiny People Anthem morphs into its mariachi component. The wavelengths of sound ooze over the shallow water of the lagoon, echo from the fiery yellow walls. The dinghies leave the dock. They float out into the canal circle around the fountain that sprinkles the turquoise water with 20 thin bejeweled streams of liquid and pass through the candy-swirled portals 
into the land of tiny people. How many people in your party? Through the gap of the wall to the exterior of the ride, Lucy notices that the cables threading the sky with gondolas seem to be drooping. Row five, Lucy says. 25 minutes later, in the next cog of her rotation, Lucy is perched in an ergonomic chair in the Rialto Bridge that overhangs the loading canals. Before her is the control panel with the big red e-stop button, the big green launch button, and the big black cycle out button that reboots the computers of the whole ride. Should something extravagant happen on tiny people, like a child falling out of the boat, someone getting seasick, or a random attack of the Kraken. There's a minute vibration in the waistline of her underwear, her cell phone, a text from Tommy. She'll check it later on her break in a half an hour. Tommy's name and existence are maintained hermetically in Tupperware and her unconscious until she is ready. Beneath her, a boat is churning towards a lagoon. A little girl twirls her glittering wand from the front row. Lucy smiles and waves at the boat as the boat passes underneath her. Just below the arched windows of this tower is a matrix of televisions offering security camera views of every angle of the attraction. This is the closest thing to omniscience, thought Lucy. Omniscience was a vocabulary word she learned in Mr. Cagnetto's 10th grade English class, but whose meaning had never come alive in her mind until now. There were boats tacking beneath her, turning by the brilliant blue fountains, the traffic jams in the white room, the tiny images of boats suffering minor whiplash while the music gloops on, and outside the queue, the oddly bow-legged gate of a tiny custodial sweeping up popcorn with a broom into the bucket of her silent butler. From where Penelope is walking, the Tiny People anthem and the polka music and the energetic yodeling of Big Rock Candy Mountain resonate with a dreamy oral synchronicity. There's a sense of cosmological order, bring privy to the music of the spheres. When she stops here on this red concrete and remains still in this transit between one attraction and another, even if one is remaining still to sweep up trash, a few pieces of popcorn that have not yet been flattened under the soles of visitors. Penelope lifts the silent butler, which clanked against its stick. Alex is yodeling in the gondola station of Big Rock Candy Mountain. She smiles at him. There is a cool trickling on her forearm. Her knees, below the starched hem of her white custodial shorts, are cross-hatched and raw, two scabs beginning to emerge from her skin. She twirls her half-broom in her hand and smiles, and then she frowns through her smile. Penelope walks around the gondola station and the cavernous queues for Big Rock Candy Mountain. A sign at the mouth of the grotto reports that the wait will be 90 minutes. A white bob's head zooms high atop the mountain before penetrating the darkness again, and a Doppler echoing of disconnected shrieks. As Penelope walks around the rockwork, its surface subtly loses its confectionery texture so that it could more thematically resemble Kilimanjaro from the vantage point of Exotic Island and the boats of Jungle Quest. She thinks of Caleb skippering boats over these animated waters and how he makes her feel so present, so equidistant from the maddening pull of her fellow custodials and the friends who are trying to get her a spot with attractions. The gondolas that thread the sky, moving towards the heart of Fantasia Land, wilt with weight and struggling appendages. An ice cream cone plummets 70 feet onto the brown pavement. Penelope sweeps it into her silent butler and sweeps repetitiously at the smear of ice cream until the bristles clear the sidewalk of the curdling contaminants. The polka music and intermittent shrieks from Big Rock Kenny Mountain fades as the drums of Exotic Island beckon, invite the pedestrian with an infectious pace. Penelope lingers there a moment between these two worlds, thinking of Caleb's muscles and adorable flop of blonde hair, and a certain harpy and tiny people who wants to scratch her eyes out. And Penelope listens to the counterpoints how these subatomic compressions find their match in the air between two worlds, in celestial perfection of her inner ears, until she hears a shout from the sky. Tommy is bopping along the river to the sound of the Mills Brothers performing Hold That Tiger. Around the river's bend, the safari boat chugs out of the canopy of vinyl banyans into dancing elephant springs. Overhead, the grumpling sky starts to darken. The spasmodic falsetto yelps from Big Rock Kenny Mountain momentarily snags the attention of passengers. An Indian elephant pirouettes, water spouting from its trunk in wet lariats, the edges of which 
douse the striped canvas roof of the boat. For a millisecond, Tommy's mind bounds up into the darkening sky over the vinyl cypresses and oaks and thinks of the perfection of Lucy. If he can win her heart, if he can displace her asshead of a boyfriend, whatever he and Lucy do, of course, is sacred. Tommy will never let her go. For gratitude, how could he ever? And then they tack around another bend into the darkness of a swamped temple. The boat puts along the undulant waters that glitters with bullion emerging on either side. Whispering fountains of gold churn underneath Ganesh, whose purple trunk, ornamented with curlicues of henna, spumes a honey jasmine tangerine stream atop the canvas, droplets falling down the sides of the boat like a brilliantly melting curtain. The tip of a broken tusk, the tip of a broken tusk scrapes through the gushes of water. The safari boat swerves left, gurgling away deeper into the darkness. 30 feet below the river, Jacob zooms through the perpetual dusk of the underhalls, intermittently illuminated by the fluorescent piping that works like a strobe light upon the golf cart. His fingers are nearly phosphorescent around the steering wheel, his grip so tight. He slows down, turns left towards the orange zone, en route to the commissary, which is a quarter mile away, underneath Cricket's tavern so close to tiny people. He hopes Lucy will still be on her lunch break by the time he races over there. His supervisor might fire him for commandeering the vehicle, whose tires whine like a toy's. Lucy has been so inexplicably peculiar this week, which he finds to be afro <laughs> Well, I shouldn't write anything I can't say. <laughs> Aphrodisiacal, somehow. That set of her jaw. Delicious pout, her blonde hair flouncing off her large shoulders. He needs to grab those shoulders to make her smile, to kiss that pout. And he needs to grab a pulled pork sandwich. He salivates at the very thought, when the emergency sirens shriek with light. The gondola's floor is melting marshmallow sunlight. Our kisses sweet air, our entangled tongue stretching taffy, and then, there are, and then are no longer conjoined. We jerk back and forth in the sky. Time is moving so slowly, but it is still a blur of clouds and screams and drizzle over exotic island. My slippery hands reverberate with the booming drums of Jungle Quest below. The tigers are so beautiful in their dancing. I could fall here into this water, which would catch me. I could plop right into Jungle Quest, wait for the mushrooms to wear off. But this feeling is too good to let go. I look up at the plaid woman, whose grip is slipping. I smile at her. I think of how beautiful Lucy is. The metallic spires of future port are infested with armadillos. The sun flares from each lens of all those dark glasses and shimmers acutely off each architectural tine. The fountains gush their water upward, over the rocks, on either side of us so far below. This is the future, now until